Yes, Mr. Halligan, dear Mr. Kalai, ladies and gentlemen, um, I don't say comrades because central bankers are completely neutral <laughs> on this. Um, I'd like to th thank you for, for having me here. I'm delighted to come. I see Jim and many other friends that I know from Irish counterparts for many, many years. Um, and coming to Ireland yesterday was a very short journey. I left the office at 3 o'clock in the afternoon and I arrived in downtown Dublin at 6 o'clock. And from the way to the, to the airport, my counsellor, who is, who is with me today, remarked that, that Ireland really has travelled a long way compared to when she was visiting Ireland for the first time as a backpacking student almost 20 years ago in the beginning of the early 90s. She recalled that her first impression on traveling from the airport downtown was at that time a rather sad one, traveling through, let's say, rundown warehouses and relatively poor residential buildings. And the picture today has completely changed. You have modern office buildings and residential areas line the streets on the short trip from the airport to the city center nowadays. This is anecdotal evidence, of course, but I think it depicts in a nutshell Ireland's truly remarkable economic development over the last 20 years. Ireland has, has managed to find a, a unique selling proposition in the European context and made use of the, the instruments the European Union offers to foster economic envelop, development and growth such as the, the structural and regional funds in a smart, honest, and sustainable way. Nevertheless, as you all know, the, the Celtic Tiger was not immune to the challenges the financial crisis posed to many of the world's advanced economies. And to the contrary, Ireland has had to deal with more severe challenges than most others. And much has been written about how Ireland arrived in this position. But I want to be, be straight at the beginning. Ireland is not the only country who needs reform. Fiscal consolidation and growth enhancing structural reforms are needed everywhere in Europe. I really say everywhere. In order to remain competitive on a global marketplace. Ireland is however one of the countries with more severe adjustment needs. Our view is that to set the correct course, we must be clear-headed about the reasons we are where we are. And to frame it somewhat bluntly, the Irish people woke up at a painful new reality when the Irish housing bubble burst at the the onset of the financial crisis in 2007 and extraordinary high growth in the run-up to the crisis had gone hand in hand with the build-up of economic and financial imbalances. The path back to full fitness has been enormously difficult and entailed wrenching economic, financial and social change. The path has not been smooth. Indeed, one and a half years ago, the economy was close to a cardiac arrest, and the patient required life support. Kept alive with substantial assistance, assistance from European lenders, international lenders, as well as continued levels of extraordinary support from the euro system. But the progress, progress since then has been good. The program is clearly on track. So far, Ireland has delivered. And so I am confident that Ireland can be a success story. Nonetheless, substantial changes, challenges remain. Ambitious structural and financial reforms are still needed. To put first and foremost 
unemployment on a downward trajectory. Second, to ensure that government finance are put on a sustainable path. And third, to secure a banking sector that can stand on its own feet again and support the Irish economy. And the last item, financial sector repair, is an absolutely crucial one. The support from the euro system in form of monetary policy and emergency liquidity loans to Irish banks has been extraordinary by any measure. With this considerations in mind, I would like today to start considering first the origin of the crisis. Second, I want to discuss some macro fiscal aspects of the adjustment process. And I want the majority of my time discussing then thirdly financial sector issues and the role of the, the ECB. I would like to present a clear view on how the ECB has supported Ireland throughout the adjustment process, working as a true partner to help this country to resolve its problems. On the origins of the crisis, someone could say in a little bit a colloquial description that when the bubble burst, the economy was lacking competitiveness, that it was unfit and overweight. Is this really a fair description of the Irish economy around 2007? It's perhaps a little harsh. It clearly misses some of the important strengths that still underpin the Irish economy and that will be crucial components for the recovery in the years to come. But we can see some elements in the Irish situation in the years 2007 and 8 in that description. Lacking competitiveness. Clearly, wages and prices had risen much too fast since the start of the monetary union. From 2000 to 2008, wages measured as compensation per employee. An island increased on average by nearly 6% a year, more than twice the rate seen on average in the euro area, eroding Ireland's competitive position. Unit labor costs had risen by 50% between 1998 and 2008, while they had risen only 19% in the euro area during the same time. Unfit, in various aspects of its national economic policy and especially supervisory policies. All of this made the country not well equipped to counteract the emerging imbalances at an early stage and to match the challenges facing the economy when the crisis took hold. The current account deficit was about 5% and about 5.5% in the years 2007 and, and 8. And certainly overweight, at least in some sectors. Ballooning credit and spending excesses had overheated the economy and misdirected resources. In 2007, Ireland was an economy that had become dangerously dependent on construction and housing as a source of economic growth and tax revenue. We had overly optimistic expectations both in the private and the public sector, which played a major role. An oversized and, put it friendly, lightly regulated financial system not only fed on these excesses, but actively supported them. And government expenditures had been set clearly on an unsustainable course based on the false assumption that very high tax receipts stemming from booming housing sector and exceptional real growth were a lasting feature of the, the Irish economy. On the expenditure side, for example, between 1998 and 2010, nominal public wages per government employee increased more than 90% 
in Ireland, significantly outpacing public wage increases in most other euro area countries by 40 or more percentage points. Only Greece saw larger increases than Ireland. And in a monetary union, these kinds of nominal growth is unsustainable. On the adjustment progress process, anyone who has ever undergone the process of recovering fitness will attest the process can be long and painful. And so it has proved. Domestic demand has shrunk. This was unavoidable as both public and private spending had increased to levels well above the sustainable productive capacity of the economy. Unemployment has strongly increased. But having said this, there are clearly three milestones to the Irish program. The first one is a return to positive growth already last year. Second, this is the progressive return to market funding well in advance before the end of the program in 2013. And third, it is reaching a fiscal deficit of 3% in 2015. Measured against these milestones, I must admit that I'm truly impressed by the way Ireland has handled its tough challenges, especially since the beginning of the last year. The economy is well on the way to restoring competitiveness, reducing the fiscal deficit. The goal for this year is minus 8.6%, and I think this can be reached given the current growth perspectives. They have overhauled the institutional framework and are on the way to restructure the, the banking sector. Ireland is the only program country that has managed to close its trade deficit and return to growth last year, even at moderate rates. But I would assume that this continues if the authorities stay committed and implement the program. We see growth for this year at in real terms at plus 0.5 and next year at plus 2 percent. This turnaround would not have been possible without Ireland's biggest asset. This is a talented, well-educated workforce in a flexible labor market. And this strength is maybe most clearly reflected in the fact that the export sector has continued has continued to attract foreign investment in the midst of the crisis. Two, structural reforms are helping to restore competitiveness and flexibility. And Ireland, as I said, benefited much from a labor market that was more flexible than the ones in Greece or in Spain. It is true that some of the structural reforms will take time to show the full effect, but their capacity to improve the situation for citizens of the country should not be underestimated. You all know better than I the, the example, the market for legal services and the market for medical services is currently being deregulated and by this made more competitive. This is something this will lower prices for Irish consumers, expand activity and increase employment. In the labor market, an important overhaul of employment contracts has been announced and this should lead to a more modern and even more flexible system to align wages to productivity in particular sectors of firms. The aim is clearly to improve the prospects for domestic firms to hire stuff. But I think we all should be, be honest with ourselves. Even though considerable progress has been made, we are still a long way before the situation normalizes. House prices have continued to fall. 
the domestic economy remains fragile. And there is considerable work to do on fiscal and structural reform. This is demanding for Irish households who have already seen their disposable incomes and wealth to decline a lot over recent years. And therefore, it's important for the success and the ownership of the program that also the relatively rich and wealthy carry a fair share of the adjustment burden. Worst of all is the fact that a large portion of the population is currently out of work, and this makes job creating structural reforms key to the program. The deep recession, high levels of public spending, a relatively narrow tax base, and the burden of supporting the financial sector have all put stress on the fiscal position of the state. As a result, the fiscal deficit has surged, but the government has rightly embarked on the path of progressively cutting expenditure while taxes have had to increase. Also here, there are no easy solutions, whether inside or outside a monetary union. Fiscal consolidation would be required in the best interests of the country. A government cannot for long periods spend substantially more than it receives in revenue. Too often, I think this debate misses the simple but crucial point. Fiscal consolidation is also not simply a consequence of the banking collapse. The financial crisis has clearly added to the Irish debt burden. But we must not lose sight of the continued high deficits run in Ireland, which must be brought under control. And let me briefly put my remarks on the need for fiscal sound policies in Ireland in a broader European context. At the European level, the crisis revealed very clearly gaps in the framework for fiscal and economic governance. And many reforms were undertaken or are underway to close these gaps. And to say this in Brussels style acronyms, this is the six pack, the two pack, the fiscal compact. All these initiatives have one goal, to establish fiscal rules and achieve a degree of fiscal coordination which lives up to the stability requirements of a monetary union. In our view, the ECB's view, the steps taken so far are necessary, but they will not be sufficient in the long run. Further steps towards a fiscal union are ultimately needed. But to enhance fiscal coordination does not necessarily imply and must not be confused with further fiscal centralization on the European level. There are many ways when you look around the globe on how you can organize a kind of fiscal union in a decentralized manner. You have the Swiss model, the German model, the Indian model, the Canadian one, the US. So we simply have to define the rules that we European want to follow and we can organize ourselves in, in very different ways. I want to be careful and also outspoken. At the same time, I have not at all the intention to lecture here the Irish audience on the best way forward for your country. It is completely up to decide by the Irish voters in the upcoming referendum at the end of May to say yes or to say no to the fiscal compact. So this is completely the decision of the, the Irish voters. I will say what I have said in other countries, what the ECB views on this is. I've said this in Finland, I've said this in Germany, in 
Belgium and France. So I will repeat this. This is a consistent view that the ECB has taken. From our perspective, a crucial element in overcoming the debt crisis in Europe is to regain confidence of market participants in the sustainability of public finances. And therefore, we believe that it's to the utmost importance that all euro area members especially adopt and implement the fiscal compact. Going back to Ireland and coming to the third part of my, my speech, for the Irish economy to achieve its full fitness, it's also necessary to heal the wounds that caused many of today's problems, and I want to now turn the attention to the Irish financial sector. The role of the euro system in Ireland over recent years, and more specifically that of the, the ECB, has often been misunderstood, sometimes been misrepresented, and I would like to take this opportunity to set the the record straight. Relatively to the size of the economy, no other euro area country has received such support from the euro system. And no other institution has provided more help to Ireland than the ECB. The EU IMF program finances combined total to 67.5 billion euros. And the Eurosystem liquidity support to all of Ireland's eligible banks has often been more than double that amount. And I'd like to recall that Eurosystem loans currently carry much lower interest rates than loans from the IMF and the EU member states. Not to be confusing, ECB support and IMF Euro Area Member State support are not on equal footing. There are no substitutes, since for good reasons there is a distinction what central bank can provide as liquidity and what is, let's say, fiscal financing to be provided by the fund and by member states. By the time the program of financial support was agreed in late 2010, the ECB had already been providing extraordinary levels of support for several years. To continue the analogy, the euro system was providing life-sustaining transfusions to the banking system. This support was fully in line with the general rules applied by the ECB to all euro area countries, but Ireland benefited more than any other country as its banking sector imbalances were particularly large. The ECB was an established key partner of the Irish authorities in staving off the worst effects of the crisis well before the adjustment program was designed. This state of affairs is a, let's say, far cry from the claims that the ECB bounced Ireland into the program in late 2010. By that time, we had already been standing for quite some time with Ireland, and that remains the case today. The support would, of course, not have been possible if Ireland had not been in the euro area. Before the EU IMF program was agreed, the total euro system loan support for Ireland, and this means combining monetary policy operations and emergency liquidity assistance from the Central Bank of Ireland amounted to about 100% of the Irish GDP. Today, our total loan provisions now stand at above 125 billion euros. There are, of course, statutory limits <coughs> what the euro system can do. And there is a clear dividing line between the task of a state and the task of a central bank. There can be no doubt that the current amount of liquidity support extended by the ECB and the Central Bank of Ireland needs to be substantially reduced 
over time. And we expect that the Irish authorities and the banks are working to achieve this. For Ireland's economy to recover, its banking system must be sound and fully functioning. This will be difficult to instill with banks that remain dependent on Eurosystem support. With measures in place to break this dependency, the conditions will be in place for recovery. The foundations for the recovery, in our view, has already been laid. And in late 2010, the ACB played a key role in mitigating faces facing the banking system and designing program measures to reverse the situation. And I hope that you, you all share my view that these measures <coughs> achieved their initial aim, the stabilization of the banking system. I know, of course, that the decisions concerning the repayment of bondholders in the former Anglo-Irish Bank have been a source of controversy. Decisions taken by the Irish authorities, such as these, are not lightly taken. And the consequences of subsequent actions are weighted carefully. It is true that the ECB viewed it as the least damaging cause to fully honor the outstanding senior debts of Anglo. However unpopular that may now seem, the assessment was made at a time of extraordinary stress in financial markets and great uncertainty. And protecting the hard-won gains and credibility from the early successes in 2011 was also a key consideration. And the main reasoning was to ensure that no negative spillover effects would be created to other Irish banks or to banks in other European countries. Determined action and the willingness to take tough, even controversial decisions has placed Ireland's financial system on a steadier footing. A necessary step for Ireland to emerge from this crisis will be to ensure the long-term viability of the banking system as a pillar of the Irish economy. Doing so will further enhance confidence in the system and limit the burden that the banking system places on the taxpayer. Any proposal to reorganize and to strengthen the Irish banking sector, and in this context, I'm aware of the debate to replace promissory notes with support from the EFSF must meet important criteria, including that it should improve the chances of both the state and the banks returning to market-based funding, and of the banks reducing their extraordinary reliance on the euro system. And we as ECB stand ready to work with the Irish authorities on such proposals. I understand the strong desire of the authorities to minimize the costs associated with the banking sector rescue, including costs incurred to date and those still to come. Let me briefly comment on this. When the program for Ireland was designed, the costs of the banking sector measures were already in place including the promissory notes, and they were fully factored in the program design. The annual cash repayments of promissory notes is therefore financed by program resources. That program is on track, and any deviation from that program should be considered very carefully indeed. The perceptions that have built around Ireland's success in the program should not be jeopardized. It has been hard won and it's worth fighting for. Therefore, the ECB remains of the opinion that Ireland should honor its debts and its commitments stemming from 
the promissory notes as foreseen. This, in our view, is the best way to regain sustainable market access in the course of the program. I have sometimes heard in the Irish debate the sense that the debt resulting from the bank rescue is not Ireland's debt. I can understand the sentiment and how many people feel about the situation. But what must be understood is that in the run-up of the crisis, insufficient policies, name it banking supervision, played a major role in excessive credit growth and risk management failures in the Irish banking sector. The ECB has no supervisory responsibility, despite claims to the contrary. However, the ECB has warned years before the crisis that imbalances were building up in the number of euro area countries. And from a market perspective, those debts associated with the banking crisis are not different from other sovereign debt. With the guarantee of 2008, large parts of the debts of Irish banks became debt of the state. And any desire to offload this debt could have dire consequences. Furthermore, to suggest that debt relief should be considered risks undermining the program by suggesting that it is needed. And in our view, Ireland's debt is sustainable, the program is on track, and Ireland has very good chances to return to markets before the end of the program. And that the authorities are capable to secure debt sustainability and along with this um, bright future. Let me conclude. Ireland has received unprecedented support from other European member states. The euro system has, within the limits of our mandate, been very supportive to the Irish banking sector and by this to the program of Ireland. Eurosystem financial support provides a good example about the difficult balancing act which policymakers policy currently face. Wean the program off the support too quickly and we might set back the recovery. Leave him too long and we risk dependency, undermining efforts for adjustment and impeding the return to full fitness. The ECB is obliged and can be trusted to always fulfill its role and deliver on the treaty mandate. And this is above all to secure price stability in the euro area as a whole, which consists of 17 countries. And there are clear limits to what the central bank is entitled or even able to do. It is impossible for the ECB to provide guarantees or assurances concerning future funding amounts or interest rates over the medium term. Certain tasks should and can in Europe be dealt only by member states and not by the ECB or the Central Bank of Ireland. Our common obje objective must be to reduce over time the reliance of the Irish banks on central bank funding and in particular on the emergency liquidity assistance. The Irish government has, in our view, the capacity to further consolidate and to implement the necessary reforms so that there will be no lingering doubts about the sustainability of government debt. I am very confident that Ireland will continue to fully implement the necessary adjustment and reforms. And on this basis, Europe and its member states will continue to show solidarity towards 
Ireland. I understood from Minister Noon, Noonan that he said champagne corks will be popped in the night the Troika leaves Dublin. As long as Ireland continues to implement fully the programme and preserves its credibility as a state that honours its obligations, I think that day will not come in the too long future. The programme ends at the end of 2013. And you will ask, what will the ECB be doing on that day the Troika returns home? Well, perhaps we will not have a similar wild celebrations <laughs> while we are central bankers at all. <laughs> but I don't understand what is wrong with a good champagne, but okay. <laughs> I suspect then that I and my fellow board members that we will raise a quiet toast to the achievement of a country that is so admirably fighting its way back to solvency and stability. And I really wish you continued success in meeting this goal. And we stand ready to work with you in achieving this goal. Thank you very much for your attention.